Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? I guess like lunch. Good morning. Good afternoon. We're doing good. Everybody's good. Good. We're going to sing a song in just a minute. Um, we've sang it here before at Kensington CT at least, but if you don't know it, it's called Raise a Hallelujah. Um, and I just feel called to remind everybody, um, including myself, that this song is not meant to be sung um, when everything's all great and all your ducks in a row, everything's going well, you're praising Jesus, which is great. But this song was designed to be sung in the middle of a storm or when, you know, you're praying for things and they haven't happened yet and you're just wondering where the heck God is in all your situations. And um, there is power in raising a hallelujah in the middle of it. And I just think it's so important to remember that, that even when you don't feel like praising God and you're just like, I don't even see you, God, in this, where are you? And I just think, you know, faith is for things uh, not seen and, and we're hoping for what God says he's going to do in his word. So this morning, I'm going to invite you to stand and uh, just think about things in your life that just haven't come to fruition yet. And we're just going to raise a hallelujah anyways.
Oh, hey, good morning, everybody. You can go ahead and have a seat. I just want to start off by saying welcome to Kensington CT. For those of you that don't know me, my name's Adam. I'm part of the team here at Clinton Township, and I want to just start by saying welcome to church. I know that there are a lot of things vying for your attention, so the fact that you're here with us is not lost on us. Whether you're sitting in our room or you're watching online, welcome to church. We're so glad that you are here with us today. And I also want to say, hey, if you're a guest, or maybe this is your second or third time here, and we have never had the chance to interact with you, we would love the opportunity to meet you. I know myself and a lot of our staff hang out in the lobby after the service, but if you have any questions about anything we do here, something that you've seen or heard, we have this place in the middle of the lobby called The Hub. There's TVs over it. There's going to be some people with bright orange shirts there. If you have any questions or just would like a little bit more information, I would encourage you to stop by there. And if you're a guest, just go over and tell them you're a guest. They will introduce yourself themselves to you and then they have a small gift just to say thanks for being here and being a part of our church this morning so falls fastly approaching we are at the end of august how many people summer is your favorite month yeah woohoo nobody nobody yeah how about fall yeah, give me a little woos of the fall. I'm excited. I saw a couple of trees that were starting to change color, which is a little heartbreaking and great at the same time because it's the end of August and it's not supposed to happen yet, but it lets me know what's coming and that's school season kicking off. Something also that let me know school season was kicking off. Maybe some of you can relate to this. When you check your credit card statement, do you notice that Target is a little bit the Target is what I referred to it this morning, Target. My wife sat over there in the first service and she gave me one of them death looks for me talking about Target. But you're doing that. You're getting the school shopping going and all those different things. Actually, my wife does a fantastic job of doing that. But it lets us know that the season is changing. And that's true here for us at church as well. Fall is kind of like the official re-kick off. I know in our youth ministry, they're going to be doing some new things, gathering again on Sundays. Our kids programming is going to be reopening rooms that were closed for the summer just because people are out and doing summer things. But with that, we would like to invite some of you to join in on this journey with us and take an opportunity, stop at the hub and talk to them about where it is you might want to serve alongside of us. We would love to have you serving with us on Sunday in youth here in the stage or cameras or in kids. And I just think something happens when we take one more step and this room that can feel really big can get a little bit smaller as we meet some people, join a team and do some things with them. So we would love for you to take that step and walk with us. And if you're watching online, we would love for you to do that with us as well. If you ever have a chance to come down and see us, that would be fantastic. So last thing, we are starting a new series today called Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is probably the most famous chapter in the Bible, the most well-known. It's a psalm written by David that we're going to be talking about today. We have our very own Craig Mays, who is here to, yeah, you can go ahead and give him a big hand clap here to lead us in our message. But we also have a couple of things we want to get, bring your attention to. This is a devotional that's gonna be uh, one devotional for every day over the next three weeks as we are in this series. We would encourage you to pick one up on your way out. If you're more of a digital person, we've got one on our website. If you go to the homepage, there's a little yellow oval link that will take you right to it. And we also have an audio version if you like to listen. And I would encourage you every day to jump in, to listen to the audio, to read something, Something happens when, A, we spend more time with Jesus, which Craig will be talking about today, but we're doing it together around this message series. So really encourage you guys to do this with us. And with that, I would love to invite Craig up here on stage with me. This isn't going to be quite as much as a surprise as it was in the first service, because it's the second one, but we have something we want to share with all of you today. First, I want to, I want to correct a mistake you made. Did anyone else hear him say, is summer your favorite month? He didn't, he didn't say season, he said month. I'm feeling very which, criticized right now. Which, which actually sometimes in Michigan feels accurate, doesn't it? Because it's felt a lot like fall here, and today's kind of like a fall day. So anyhow, I'll let you go on that. I'll, I'll let that one slide for right now. Well, actually, I was going to come up and talk about the Psalm series, but we decided to let him do that because I want to share something with you. I have some sadness today because we have someone who has served here for four years and has served us so well. And before I say his name, I just want you to think about what you see every Sunday, week in and week out. The production value, the beauty, the creativity, the artistry, the excellence, all of that doesn't happen by accident. It takes people that God has given gifts and skills to, passion, commitment. And this describes Stan Shilliday, who has been our production director for four years. And you can see on the screen a picture of Stan and his family, um, his daughters, Elena and Isabella, his wife, um, 
Mel, who has been here a few times reading on stage. They had amazing ministry for years in South Africa that really went all over the world. And God blessed us by having them here for four years. But they're moving to Tennessee. Everybody goes south from Ooh. Michigan. If I want, I'm waiting for someone to say God called us to like Alaska. Yeah. This never happens. But, he doesn't make those calls, does he? But yeah. anyhow, uh, Stan is an amazing artist. He's become a good friend. When I'm in Michigan, we try to hang out. I've been over to their home many times. And uh, he's a behind-the-scenes person. Even though he's an artist as well, he plays instruments, he sings, all of that. He's never done that. That's been his role here. And so I thought we could bless him by you either uh, probably just turn around and just wave to the booth. He's not going to stand up and just put your hands together and say, He's thank you, He's on your left, the guy in the back left, yeah. So we're definitely going to miss Stan and Mel and everything they bring, but Nashville's getting a little bit lucky, so thankful for them and the opportunity for their family. Hey, we're mm -hmm. going to watch a, a video here in just a second. I think it's the video of me. Yeah, it is. It's kind of a letdown, but no, I'm yeah. just... <laughs> I'm so much trouble. If you were if you were here last week, this is a this is a uh, rewind because people don't come every week. So it's a vision moment that I did a little while ago. We want you, in case you missed it, to hear it today. So I'm sorry if you've already sat through this one time. Feel free to check messages on your phone, whatever you want to do. But all joking aside, it, it's a very great video for our church opportunity. I think the Lord is leading us into. Yep. And I'll come up after and say a few more words about it. But right now, we want you to stand up, say hi to somebody, and we'll Shake get going. <clears throat> Hello, Kensington family. I'm excited to share with you a few thoughts on the coming ministry season. But first, I want to express that I am deeply grateful and humbled to step into the position of lead pastor of Kensington Church, a church I have known and loved and which has had such impact on me for more than 22 years. Every time God has asked something big of me, I have been just like Moses, standing right in front of a burning bush, arguing with God, <laughs> telling him that he was got the wrong guy. But every time, God has won the argument. In the video announcing my position as lead pastor in June, Kensington founder Steve Andrews and I shared that we as a church are moving forward. We expressed our excitement about where God is leading us, but on the heels of that video, our elders and leaders brought to my attention that their work on the 2022-23 budget revealed a need for reduction based on certain economic realities, which would impact our staff and our programs. This new budget reduction honestly did not sit right with me. To talk about moving forward only to immediately cut back seemed incongruent. As I thought and prayed about this, I sensed very strongly that there was another path before us. Three things came to mind. The first was celebration. While two and a half years of COVID decimated many organizations and churches, that has not been the story at Kensington. Our in-person attendance is still well below our pre-COVID numbers, and yet our giving has only suffered about a 10 to 15% reduction. That is not the story that we are hearing from so many churches. The second thing is perspective. As I thought about the idea of coming to you with news of reduced budget, I remembered so many accounts in scripture in which we see God asking his people in faith to step into challenges where the odds did not look good. Consider the little shepherd David running at the giant Goliath, declaring victory in advance, and God telling Gideon that his army was too big and to reduce it. In both cases, everyone knew when the victory came that it came from God himself. And the third thing is opportunity. I believe we have a amazing opportunity before us. One of the most remarkable things about this past year is that three times we came to you with an urgent need globally. We asked for help for refugees needing to flee Afghanistan and then Ukraine. We shared with you the need for funds to transform our global partners hospital in India into an emergency COVID facility. I don't know if you know this, but these three opportunities resulted in over $1 million in giving above and beyond our general fund. This is truly extraordinary. In the midst of COVID, in the midst of low attendance, I ask, how else but God? The size of the gap that we are facing in the budget for next year is about a million dollars. As I reflected on all of this and discussed it with our elders and Kensington's leadership team, it became clear to all of us that rather than coming to you with talk of taking steps backward, 
We should instead maintain the budget and move forward in faith. My desire is to be transparent with you about our current reality and to ask you to join us in trusting God to provide. I know you would want to know this is your church and to be given an opportunity to respond. Just as we ask for your help with the three global needs, we are now asking you to consider helping us to fill in this financial gap in order to allow us to fulfill the vision and mission of Kensington. In the Bible, David responded to the challenges that he faced with these words that we find in Psalm 44, 6. He wrote, I will not trust in my bow, nor will my sword save me. David had his sword, and he had his bow, and he used them, but he never forgot that victory belonged to God. So we are carefully reviewing our budget to ensure that all we invest in lines up with our mission to which we believe God has called us. We're being wise with the tools in our hands. We are doing our due diligence, yet we know it is God in whom we place our trust, and only through him can we accomplish this. As we look ahead to 2022-23, we are asking you to join us in trusting God's faithfulness and to consider what your role might be in helping us to fill this gap. And if Kensington is your home church, I just wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart for the open-handedness that we've seen all year long and I believe we will see in the days ahead. As I think about what's coming in the future, as I think about this fall, the start of the ministry season, I believe that God is gonna do abundantly more than all we can ask or imagine. Man, that guy's, that guy's pretty handsome and articulate, wouldn't you agree? I could listen to him all day long. Unfortunately, I have to in my head all day long. Um, you know, I can go back to that moment. Uh, we recorded this a few weeks ago, but I can go to that, back to that moment at the end of May when I felt blindsided by this request. Would I be willing to step into this role for a season? And Chris and I wrestled with it. And we wrestled with God, and we really got clarity that this is what he was inviting us to do. And then as I said in the video right away, now I'm responsible for the budget, the whole budget in some respects of oversight. And I was told that, you know, we've done really well. We were so great. We've been so grateful for your generosity in a difficult time. But now we're going to have to cut back. And that means having conversations with staff. And th this is what happened in my mind. I pictured me here at Clinton Township because this is always going to be my home here. Um, but having conversations in the lobby where you come to me and you say, um, man, I heard that we laid off these staff members. I didn't know we were in trouble because we didn't tell you. So you would not have responded to India, Ukraine, Afghanistan if we hadn't told you, here's the need. So I went to the leadership and said, why don't we tell the congregation where we're at, give them a chance to step forward. You know, my wife and I are evaluating our own giving and, and just give you the opportunity. And that's what this is. It's an opportunity above and beyond your normal giving. If this is your church home, if this is your first Sunday, this is not, we don't talk about money. If we talk about money a lot, raise your hand. See, we don't. I mean, a couple hands went up. Okay, we'll, try, we'll work on that. But, um, but this is, none of this is ever really about money. It's about the vision that God has given to us and, and what is he asking us to do and can we trust him? So this is definitely a trust thing. But it wasn't just me. I can't operate independently. We have a team. We have elders. We have a team of leaders. We came together. We prayed. A few of us are fasting every Wednesday during the season. If you want to join us, no big deal. You don't even have to tell us. Just take Wednesday as a day to fast and really ask God to pour out his bl blessings abundantly. So we were able to go to the staff and say, it, it was a challenging year, but we're trusting God for the next year. Let's just run together and accomplish the things that God has put before us. So that's where we're going right now. Um, a few people already since last week have come to me and said, we're in. We're praying about how much. That's what I would ask you to do first. Don't write a check. Don't go online. Give, pray about it. Ask what God is telling you, if anything, to do. Some of you, right now, you can't do anything, and that's fine. Let God lead you, and then you just give the way you normally give. There's no special fund. You're giving to the Kensington General or the Kensington Fund, and that will allow us to fulfill uh, what we hope we can do this next year. So in advance, I just want to say thank you uh, for participating with us. Well, as um, Adam said, we're jumping into Psalm uh, 23. This is a journey that I've been on for about five years now with the psalm, four to five years. It's been extraordinary. It's a burn in my heart. I wanted to do this series. All the pastors agreed we're doing this series. We begin today. I'm so excited about it. It's going to be very autobiographical in terms of the journey that I've been on with God. But the thing I want to say is this is a crazy world we live in today in terms of pace, demands, time, communication, information. It's overwhelming. And the one thing I do know is that the quiet life, interior life that we cultivate in a relationship with God is assaulted by all of that. 
in spite of good intentions, in spite of what we know to be true, in spite of what the invitation we see in Scripture for us to connect with God, there's so much competition right now. And so as we prepare for the moments ahead of us today, watch this video and watch the contrast and see where you feel your own heart being drawn. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me into paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Did you just in those 45 seconds experience two realities? Like, how many have that ringtone, by the way? So you just, your heart skipped a beat and you probably checked, like, what, who? So all that busyness and noise and craziness and images coming and going, just ramp it up, right? And then darkness, and then, then a stream, and that beautiful voice with that beautiful accent, reading ancient words from scripture. And you feel like you can breathe. So the question I'm going to pose today, is it actually possible to create that interior reality that goes with us into all the noise? That is a safe place, a secure place, a peaceful place, a joyful place, a patient place. Is that really possible? And David, who wrote the psalm we're going to look at, would say absolutely yes. But it's not easy. Um, here's an experience I had that tells me how hard this is, or maybe how hard it's become for me. This may, maybe will tell you something about me, and you'll probably be glad that Adam is your normal teacher and not Craig. <laughs> this actually happened. I'm in my office. It's a midweek. i am got a message almost done, but I'm fine-tuning it, and I've got a few hours, and I haven't checked email in a while, so I'm trying to check email, and all of a sudden I remember that I was supposed to call Chris, my wife. She probably left me a message three hours before. It's kind of important. Please call. So I grab my phone in my office. And I dial her number, and I hear it ringing, and then all of a sudden my cell phone is also ringing. Good timing, great. She's not answering, so I reach over, I grab my phone without looking at it. I just say, hello. And now I hear the voice on the phone, so I know Chris has answered the phone. So I don't know who this is, but I say, can you hold on just a second? I put the phone down, I pick up my office phone again, and I say, hey, honey, can you just... And while I'm saying it, I can hear this person is still talking. And I'm thinking, didn't you just hear me say, hold on a second? So I say, honey, can you hold on a second? Put it down. I go back and I say, hey, I'm sorry, but I have another call. And I can hear my wife still talking, I think. I do this for about five times before I realize I accidentally called myself. <laughs> Instead of dialing my wife's number, I dialed my number, but I didn't know it. And I'm talking to myself, feeling frustrated, talking to myself. Now, 20 years ago, that was impossible. Like so many things we're doing now, we never had to deal with before because it's the world we live in. And, you know, in the meantime, I got all these emails I haven't been able to answer, and I got a message coming up, and I just feel like there's, where's the peace and where's the balance? It's just a crazy, challenging world that we live in. I think every generation has felt that, but everything shows the rate of growth, information dis dissemination, everything is unprecedented, and it's just going to get more challenging. So with that in mind, hear these words. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I just hear those words and I say, wow. Could that be more my reality than the noise and the beeping and the buzzing and the distractions and the information and the agitation and the anxiety and the frustration and the impatience that's in me and it seems like it's everywhere around me? It's hard to even drive on the roads. Everybody seems in a hurry to go somewhere and they're mad that you're not going fast enough. Or maybe you're that person. Can we really find, is this psalm written thousands of years ago have any relevance for today? And I'm here to say absolutely 100%. And we're going to take three weeks to lead you in that. And as Adam said, we have all kinds of resources we built around it. The, this journal that you're going to get on your way out. And if you're online, you can download it or come back next week and get a hard copy. Um, 21 uh, readings that I wrote that come out of my journey the last four or five years. I want to say all of it in one 30-minute message. And if I do, I'll have to talk as fast as Adam. And I can't do that. So um, I'm going to encourage you to use this because I have so much more to say than I'm going to be able to say today. But I'm excited about this because this has transformed my life. I'm not kidding you. It's transformed my life, and I believe there's a power for those of you that need it. And some of you are you're in that rhythm right now, and God bless you and help us, the, those of us that are more agitated to get better at it. But there is a, there's an invitation to a life that we're going to look at starting today and for the next two Sundays that can really create an oasis with God, a place of joy and intimacy and peace and comfort and stillness while all this is going on around us. I really believe that because I've experienced it. Before we dive into this, we're going to take a moment to receive our offering. And this is what we do every week, not because we want your money, but we want you to participate in the beauty of what God is doing. Because what God is doing here requires resources. And so the stuff we do locally including the discipleship, the messages, the band, everything we do here on Sunday, but what we do all week long through our communities, what we do around the world right now in this very moment in India and in Kenya and Nepal and in Cuba and all over the place, you are investing in that. So that's what this is about. And you can see ways to give. Um, if you're online or here, you can use all the electronic ways to give. Or if you're here, we do have a box in the back that you can drop a check. So I, we, Adam and I say this every week, but we're, we're grateful because none of this happens without you being a true full partners with us in this. So, so a little bit of context for David. Um, David was in his early life, he was a shepherd of sheep. And he spent so many hours day after day, day and night, during the daytime, during the nighttime, caring for a flock of sheep. He knew all about it, what the shepherd's role was, what the sheep were like. And so it's out of this experience that he comes and picks up his pen and writes this psalm. Only interestingly, he writes it from the perspective of the sheep. In this psalm, he's the sheep describing the shepherd, and he knows what he was like as a shepherd. He knows about that relationship, and so there's incredible value in this, in this perspective that he has, seeing God as the shepherd, because that's what he's writing. But the other part of the context that's important is this. What was going on in David's life when he wrote this psalm? He was a young man who had been promoted anointed, chosen by God to be the next king. The first king of Israel was Saul. Saul messed up. God said, sorry, but I got to get another guy. He anointed David. And Saul said, nothing doing. I'm not going to abdicate. You can't have the throne. And he did worse than that. He decided that the only way to stay on the throne was to kill David. So he goes on a manhunt looking for David, chasing him. Not for seven hours, not for seven days or seven weeks or seven months, for seven years. David has a promise from God that you are the next king and he has no fulfillment of it. Anything you're waiting on, you're praying about, it's not happening. David's been there. In fact, when he writes this song, this is where he is. It's likely he wrote this psalm from a cave because that's where he often hid from Saul. Saul was coming with an army with swords and spears and weapons to take his head off. And David's in the, in the cave, in the darkness, unfulfilled promises, disappointed expectations, and he writes these words. You got to hear that. It's so critical. He's not sitting by the Sea of Galilee in Israel with his feet in the sand in an umbrella providing shade with a little drink with an umbrella in it, saying how good God is, how much of a comfort he is, how he provides for him. He's in a crisis in his life, and yet this comes from his heart. 
And that's important because this is not a pie in the sky. Boy, if I could just have all these problems go away, maybe I could connect with God. Maybe I could trust him more. No, David's saying right in the middle of it, right in the middle of it, he pens these words. I also want to give you a little bit of context um, in terms of where this came from, from my own heart. So about uh, seven or eight years ago, uh, Mike Carnell, who is an elder, he's been an elder at Kensington almost from the beginning, a good friend of mine, I'm living in New York, but he's inviting me to go to a place called Gethsemane Abbey in Kentucky. In northern Kentucky, in the Blue Hills, there's a monastery where the monks live, and they've created a space there, almost like hotel rooms, but no internet, no TV, whatever, for people like you and me to come down free of charge and do a silent retreat. Now, you know what the most important word in that is? Silent. And they mean it. When you walk on their grounds, zip it. So you'll see other people there at the mealtime sitting in the cafeteria, but all you hear is the clinking of silverware. No talking. So seven or eight years ago, I finally, after you know, Mike twisting my arm, inviting me for years, I decided to go down to Gethsemane. And I went down there, and I was in a very agitated state of mind, a lot of anxiety, whatever, and I thought, this is going to be really good for me. And the first day was almost like hell. I couldn't quite the voice in my head. There, I, there was no distraction, no cell phone, no computer. That freaks a lot of you out even to think about that. But it, it freaked me out, and I, didn't, I, was, I couldn't sleep. I'm staring at the ceiling. Why am I here? God, what's going on here? I'm not hearing from God. It was like it, my brain was like monkeys loosened in a room jumping around. That's what it felt like. Day one, day two, started the lesson. Day three, oh, breath. Oh, perspective. I took out my journal. I wrote like 50 pages of just you, almost illegible, everything like a dump, everything out. And they also have miles and miles of trails through the woods, and so I would go out for long walks. And along the way, they would put, occasionally they have sculptures of things, um, I'm going to show you one in a moment, that relates to what we're talking about today. So I began to go every year. I would take three days, four days, maybe five is the longest I've gone. It, it, it's been so good for my soul, an annual retreat like that, to kind of reset everything and to try to hear God, quiet all the voices. So I, I'm down there a few years ago. I think it was four or five years ago. COVID has kind of screwed up my calendar. I can't think right about stuff, dates. But maybe four or five years ago, I go down there. I need it really bad at this time. Things at work and my work in New York City was not going well. I was under a lot of stress and Chris and I were, my wife were doing a lot of this and I just, I got to get, I just, God, I need your help. So I go down there and I put on my backpack one day and I put like a sleeping bag in the back and I walk out and I'm looking for a particular statue or a sculpture I know I've seen. And I come upon it and I want you to take a look at it. It's on the screen. This is also in the devotional you're going to get. So you have a copy of that. What is that? That's a shepherd with a sheep, a little lamb actually. And so I took out my sleeping bag, if you can picture this, and I'm out in the woods, there's nobody around, I roll it out, and I have my Bible and my journal, and I lay down so I'm facing the statue, and I just look at it. Nothing, just looking at it. I grab my Bible, I turn to Psalm 23, read it, I look at it, I put it down. It's a half hour, 45 minutes. Breathing, I'm looking at the trees, I'm hearing the wind, I feel the sun coming through the trees, the warmth of that. And I just got overwhelmed unexpectedly looking at this. I stayed there for three hours in quietness, in silence, trying to hear God. And he said some things to me, which I'm going to share with you today. <laughs> and since then, he's been saying it to me. And I want to show you, this is my journal. I love these because hardcover, but they open up nice. And I have 50 of these probably filled now. This one started July 22nd of this summer. Every time, look what, if you can see it, look what's in the front cover. That picture that you saw, and this is Psalm 23. When I recited it a few minutes ago, it's not because I memorized it. I like tried to memorize it. For four years, I start every day, line by line, looking at the picture, each line, remembering what he said to me and what he's doing in me. And I'm going to give you a challenge, two, a couple challenges. One is I would encourage you to get familiar with it so it's in you. You know it like I know it. Anybody can do it. Six verses. And then if this is helpful, and it may be as I share my message with you today, to visualize what God is inviting us into and what he can do in our hearts and how we can live in this crazy world and find a center that's full of peace and a sense of well-being. So today we're going to go, we're going to look at the first three verses, next week two verses, and then we're going to end in two weeks with the last verse of Psalm 23. So we're going to jump in, and I'm, I've entitled this message, 
Uh, it's, it's about two things. It's about um, presence and provision. So the first thing is presence, and this is where it begins. David says, the Lord, which by the way, in your Bible, you'll see it's all capitalized. I say more about this in the first reading in your devotional. So if you start tomorrow, you'll read this. The Lord is Jehovah, which is the Latin version of Yahweh, which is the Hebrew name for God that God gave to Moses. When Moses said, who, are, who should I say sent me? He said, I am that I am, which is four letters in the Hebrew, which means, which is Yahweh. This is the creator of the world. So think about what David is saying. The one who made everything, who we could say, the Lord is my king, he's my God. He says, the Lord is what? My shepherd. What's the significance of that? And this is what I began to feel when I laid there in, in the sun on that afternoon looking at the statue. I began to see where I had gotten it wrong. And this is my default. I get it wrong. I'm going to get it wrong again. Almost every day I have to reset it. The Lord, the creator of the universe, is my shepherd. The Lord of the universe, if you allow him to be, is actually your shepherd. And that statue shows it, that sculpture shows it so well because the thing I, I began to think as I was looking at this is, look at how big he is compared to the lamb. Oh, perspective. I got to right-size God and right-size myself. I have to remember that he's the one out in front leading, caring, providing, taking care of. And I'm the one that has one little job to do, and that's to keep my eyes on the shepherd and just follow him. Every day. Every hour of every day. As soon as the little lamb runs away to go on his own, Craig runs off on his own to do his thing or figure it out or find his strength or his ability, he's in trouble. And now the stress and the anxiety and everything is going to come. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, is the next phrase. What does that mean, I shall not want? It means I'm okay, I'm content, because you provided, you're with me, you're caring for me, you're providing for me. If I have all this anxiety and a sense of exhaustion and I can't do all this, guess what? I push the shepherd aside and now I'm the sheep and I'm in charge. And you, can't live that, you can live life that way, but you and I are going to pay a price when we do. God says basically to what he said to me in that day, and he said it every day since, is, will you let me be God and let you be Craig? And don't flip-flop it. Like, keep it in order. And look at, look at the statue. Look at the sculpture. Look at the size. Get perspective. Right-size yourself. Right-size God. I, wish, I shall not want. Anybody have a list of things you want right now? I mean, it's okay to want things, but I mean things that are just agitating. And you can't fix them. You've tried. You can't control it. They're just there. They gnaw at you. They nag at you. You wish it was different. And there's no, it's not wrong to wish things are better and different in your life. But how is, how is being anxious helping it? How do you get rid of that ang anxiety? There's the shepherd. I mean, think about this for a moment. The shepherd's job, let's do it the other way. Do you think the sheep, when they would wake up every day under David's care or any shepherd's care, their first waking thoughts were, oh no, what if there's no food today? Oh, what if there's no water to drink and we're thirsty? Oh, what if that lion or bear comes over the hill and, and, and comes after me and kills me? Oh, I'm so worried about my day. I've never interviewed a sheep. <laughs> but I don't think that's what they think. But I know that's how I can wake up every day. I can wake up at 4 in the morning and have thoughts like that. They're usually not about food and water and a bear, but it, it's the version of that. They don't think that because that's not their job. You know whose job it is to make sure that they have food, water, and the bear doesn't get them? It's the shepherd's job. So I look at it this way. When a sheep wakes up, you know, they've been lying down and having a good night's sleep, and now the sun is coming up and they wake up. I think they get up and they go, oh, there he is. I'm okay. Like, what if we woke up every day and did that? Oh, you're here. Because he is. But we get up and we get in our cars and get out in our life and our business and all the stuff, and we don't need time to say, oh. In fact, if I could, oh man, I shouldn't say this. I'll, I'll get fired. Oh wait, I'm in charge. <laughs> I do report to the elders though. I would like to add, add a word to Psalm 23.1. The word because, because I think that's implied. There's a semicolon, the Lord is my shepherd, semicolon, I shall not want. I think what he's saying is because the Lord is my shepherd, I'm not going to live in this state of perpetual anxiety and agitation because he's my shepherd. 
Isn't that amazing? Could we actually live in this reality? Well, that's what began to happen to me. Uh, as I took this home, I took a picture of that. I put it in my journal. My staff at the mission in New York City, there's 200 and some staff. I made a copy for everybody and said, put this on your desk, on your window, someplace as a reminder. Um, actually, on my phone. When I turn on my phone, well, that's a nice sunset. <laughs> when I turn on my phone, that's the screen. Every time it comes on, I see the same thing because I'm stupid because I'm going to go back to the same old thing. I need a reminder of this. So, so David begins, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then the next thing he says is so amazing. So that was, the, that was the presence. Now let's move into the provision. By the way, the question here for you, I would ask you to pause with this question. Am I free from the clutches of anxiety? And if you're not, if you can't say I'm free from that, then that means that you probably are trying to get out ahead of God and lead and take responsibility for everything and try to fix it and control it instead of giving it to him. I shall not want. So now we move from presence to provision. That's what the next few verses are about. So he goes, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then I love this. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He makes and he leads because he knows what's good for us. Um, slow down, Craig. Stop. No, don't, don't, while you're still in bed, pick up your phone and look at the news or look at your email or your text messages. Don't. Because you're not going to get off that path once you get down there. You know what you need, Craig? You need a green pasture. And you need still waters. And for the sheep, that probably represented food and water that they needed to live. But for us, it represents a place where we live in trust. Where we can rest, where we can breathe, where we can release. So as I did for those two or three hours, in New York City, I can't find that very easily. A place to lay in a sleeping bag, I would end up in jail, probably. So, I, I, and I've tried, by the way. I, when I first moved there, I would go to parks, Washington Square Park, early in the morning. No one's there. It's near NYU. Um, and I, I remember one, the first time I tried this, I went down there. Nobody was in this huge park. I went over and found a bench, got my Bible, my journal out, looking up at the sky. It was beautiful. It's, it's in Manhattan, but there's also the trees around. It's really beautiful. And I'm there for like five minutes, and a guy walks in. I go, oh, I'm not alone. Well, that's okay. No, he has a trombone case. He pulls out his trombone pulls it out, pulls out his music stand, puts his music, rah, rah, rah. and I know why he was practicing in a park at 6 in the morning, because he was horrible. <laughs> so it's a big park, so I grab my stuff, I walk kitty corner across the other side of the park, I get over here, and um, I sit down, and about, literally about five minutes, some guy who, I'm sorry, I, I, and I did have compassion for him, because he was clearly mentally ill, but he's talking to nobody, and then when he got tired of talking to no money, he decided to talk to me. And he was yelling at me and making up all kinds of stuff. And I go, oh, God, really? So I go over to the other side of the park. I get way over here. And then there was some people showed up, and they were practicing some acting thing. And they had their scripts. And I was like, I forget about it. So I just went home, and I, I never talked to God again. That was 10 years ago. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, right. I'm seeing if you're paying attention. <laughs> Green pastures, where are they for you? One of the things I started doing was, with this, the help of this picture, um, is wherever I was, usually in my apartment, sitting in a chair in the morning, I would close my eyes and I would, this is what I picture. So just go with me in this. In fact, if you want to close your eyes, you can. I would feel the grass on my back. I could feel the heat of the sun. Not too hot, just the warmth on me. I could hear the, the leaves blown slightly by the wind. I'd become aware that nothing's asked of me right now. I'm just breathing and Jesus, my shepherd, is with me. In fact, I have a pretty vivid imagination. I, would picture, I could see his shadow from the sun on me. He's that close. And then, if I could stay in this long enough, if you, if you look at that picture later, you'll see his hand is stretching down toward the little lamb. I would feel Jesus' hand come and rest on my head. And sometimes, like when I was a little boy and my mom would sit with me and she'd do this to my hair. I'm not kidding. I would, I would feel that. I would imagine it. And there was such a comfort in a place of safety. No matter what was going on, it didn't matter because he's with me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I don't feel made to so much anymore. I feel like I can't live without this. I don't want to get on my day without this. And then the still waters. Maybe one of those two images is better for you. If, you're, if you've ever been in a pond or a lake where it's, there's no ripple, it's almost hard not to have some peace come. And God gave us an imagination. If you can physically get to a pasture or still waters, do that. But if you can't, just close your eyes and picture it and breathe and be aware that he's with you. Because this is what God has for us in this life, in this real life we have to live with all the 
hardships and challenges and things to be anxious about and things to want. Can't get rid of that. What you can do, what we can do, what I can do is find green pastures and still waters. And then here's the outcome, which is what I love. He restores my soul. And so the, the question that I have for this one is, is this. What's the condition of your soul right now? As I ask that question in your own heart, how do you answer that? In the soul, you know, theologians can debate soul, spirit, heart, how the Bible uses these things almost interchangeably. I don't really care about that. What I care is that this is your interior life. This is the part of you made in the image of God. This is the part of you that will live forever. Your body's going to die. It's going to fail. Your soul lives forever. You, we live and operate out of our soul. So it's got to be in good condition or living's going to be hard. David is saying, even in being chased by Saul, my life's threatened, army's coming after me. I don't want, because I found the green pastures and the still waters, and in that place he restores my soul, and I can take this day, because I'm not alone. That's the invitation from this. And then the last thing, the other thing he provides is direction. Anybody here need some direction right now? I talked to a, a friend out in the lobby who's in a challenging job situation and he's thinking of leaving and he's interviewing, but he doesn't know and it's hard. And I don't think God is like a genie in the bottle where you pray and then he writes in the sky. It's never worked for me. But the more time you spend with a shepherd, and we'll see in a few moments, Jesus said the sheep learn, they hear my voice. So the trust is, because this is the last phrase, the last one we're going to look at today. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And then he leads me in the paths of righteousness. And some translations say he leads me on the right path. And I think it's all of that. It's both our character, our moral choices, how we live. But it's also we have to make decisions. Marry this person, not marry this person. Take this job, not take this job. Invest in this, not invest in this. Buy this boat, not buy this boat. Whatever it is. He wants to be with us in every one of those things. So can you see the flow here? If we're... If we're if he's our shepherd, meaning we've right-sized ourselves in him, he's the leader, we're the follower, and then we have pasture time, I call it, and on that pasture time now, there's a peace and calm and a trust that grows, an ability to hear his voice, and now decisions come, and he leads us. Like, I think Psalm 23, as I've spent the last several years, and I've been, I've been doing what I'm doing right now for 40 years. And I, I learned Psalm, how many learned Psalm 23 when you were a child? I mean, it's a child's poem is what it felt like to me. It's good stuff, he's shepherd, it's kind of cute. Go into a bookstore, they got a little picture of a shepherd with Psalm 23 on it. It's kind of cute, fuzzy, warm, make you feel good. No, this is deep theology. This is the depth of God. This is the invitation of God to live life with him, not as a religious person, not as someone that checks the box, Press into him. This is what he's inviting us to. Let me be your shepherd. Let me lead you. You follow me. I promise you that you can have peace and comfort and joy in the midst of everything and that I will help you as you navigate all of life's decisions. This is the invitation to us. This is what Psalm sets before us. That kind of life. And I can say, you know, I, I said I've been doing this for 40 years, so why just four or five years ago? I don't know. I think there were other things from John 15. God was leading me and guiding me, but this has become such a visual tangible, touchable, embraceable, tender invitation to be with God. And I can say that I feel every day, every day, the presence of the shepherd. I need to close my eyes and I need to be, my back is on the grass and I can feel his hand on my head and I can tell, I can hear him say how much he loves me. You know, I learned a song when I was a child. Would you like me to sing it? Yeah. No, you have never heard me sing. Don't say that. I will give you the lyrics. If you grew up in church... Depends on what kind of church. You probably knew this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones, to him belong. They are weak. He is strong. Now, I do have one critique of it now, that I'm this really smart theologian. Child song. The Bible tells me so. Yes, it does. We start there, but we got to get past that. That's just a verse. That's just words on a page. When you spend time with the shepherd... Day in and day out, it doesn't happen overnight, you begin to feel loved by him. I, I, had a, I had an experience yesterday, I can't really explain it why and when this happens, but 
I was going over my message, and I had some time, and I was by myself, and I, was, I put on a little bit of worship music. I was laying on the bed where I stay when I'm here in Michigan, and um, he just showed up. The shepherd showed up. I, I was weeping for 10 minutes because I was feeling so loved by him. I felt the love that was so the embrace. But I, I've been putting myself, and I'm not bragging. I did it out of need and desperation. I put myself in a position where that could begin to happen. Instead of running out into my day, first thing, of just resting with him and letting this psalm be my guide. I give him my wants. I go through the list every morning. I don't just say I shall not want. I, then I say, well, I'm wanting right now. Let me tell you what it is. You know, but let me just say it out loud. Right now I'm anxious about this, whatever. And then, all right, pasture time, still water time. Oh, I feel, I feel the soul being healed right now. And by the way, this isn't going to work for tomorrow. I need that tomorrow again. I can't boot off of it. You guys, if you think about the physical body, does that work? I'm going to lift some weights and then take a break. Come back next week, do 10 more minutes. If you do that, your arms are going to look like mine. I saw Adam up here and I was like, what's wrong with me? <laughs> Busting out of his shirt. I got to get smaller size shirts, what I got to do. <laughs> but what about, what, about our, so what about our souls? You think it works any different? No, it's the same thing. And it's not like religious duty or obligation, like I, I, I better do this. No, it's, it's God, the shepherd, looking out at his flock, seeing you as a sheep, saying, come here, come here. Let me take care of you. Will you let me take care of you? That's what I'm here for. That's the invitation of Psalm 23. But here's why, how, how I want to end. I'm, this clock is telling me I'm out of time, so I'm going to just say this very quickly. If you go to Psalm 23, from Psalm 23, and the journal will direct you to do this at several points and go to John 10. John 10 is an amazing chapter. It's where Jesus said, I came that you would have life and have it to the full. But that's John 10, 10. But before and after, he uses the metaphor of a shepherd. And he says, I'm the shepherd. So when I read Psalm 23, I picture Jesus. He's the shepherd. And here's what he says. In John 10, talking about himself as a shepherd, he calls his own sheep by name. He knows your name. He calls you by name and leads you. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. This is about learning that voice. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And that's, that's one of the things that David talks about elsewhere. That when the bear and the lion came after the sheep, he ran after with his bare hands and fought them off because he loves his sheep. That's Jesus. He fights for you. He comes after you. He pursues you. He invites you, all of us, into that. When I was in India the very first time, over 20 years ago, with my daughter who was 11, we were traveling about five hours by car, which in India is the scariest experience you can possibly imagine. And all these animals in the road, and we had to go around water buffalo and goats and sheep. And after a couple hours of this, my, our host, Jaya, said to me, do you notice the difference between the sheep and the goats, besides that they're different animals? I said, oh, I didn't really notice anything. He says, well, watch next time. He said, here's what I want you to look for. Um, with the goats, they have a bunch of shepherds around them with sticks beating on them to get them in line because they won't, they won't obey. But when you come to the sheep, notice that there's one shepherd out front with his staff, and they're all looking at him and following him. And it's almost like he has eyes in the back of his head because if one little one starts to wander off, he turns and he hits his staff down and says something very quiet, and that snaps its head, gets right back in line. Man, with that imagery, I look at John 10.10 10 and say, Jesus is out in front of us, inviting us to follow him. And when we don't, hey, Craig, Come on, let's get back in line. But what I see in the sheep and what David was describing here was a sheep who developed this deep desire to be with the shepherd and a deep trust in the shepherd to lead them. So I'm going to pray in a moment, and we're going to see, um, we're gonna, before we worship together, we're going to see a video that we put together, Kensington did. It was, the song was written by Tatiana, who led our midweek this week. And it's, she wrote an original song based on Psalm 23. And by the way, this is available, will be available online to download the audio or the video, I think. So let this just wash over you, the imagery of someone who is um, experiencing the reality that, that God is our shepherd. So God, we just, 
We give these next moments to you because the, this work is assaulted today by pace of life. I know it in my own experience how easy it is to believe this but not act on it. And so I pray that the work of your spirit will be in my heart in the next moments and everyone here to really sense the invitation to be drawn in to this intimate relationship where you provide everything that we need in your name. Amen.
of the goodness of God. Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. So good to have Aaron back with us, isn't it? Thank you, Aaron and Katie. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, here's what activated in my imagination during that song. Running, the, the goodness running after us. So I pictured a little sheep cut off the path, and the shepherd leaves the 99, as Jesus said in, in, John, in Luke 15, and runs after this little sheep, scoops him up in his hands, embraces him, and says, no, 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 come on, let's go back. Come back home. That's God. He's running after us. When we, when we wander away, he's not mad. He's desirous. He longs for us to be with him, and he runs after us. I hope that that spoke to your heart. Um, one thing, just before we go today, so we announced it last week. We're, we're saying it again. Next week is our annual vote. Once a year, we vote on two things. We vote on the elders and, and the budget. We're affirming both that are presented to us. So Mike and Sharon and Peng Lee, three elders, are continuing. And then I and Craig McGlasson, who leads our Orient Campus, are joining the elder board. So we make up the five elders. And then the budget. And if you want more information to learn who the elders are or more about the budget, certainly please go to kensingtonchurch.org slash vote. And all the information is there. And then next Sunday, uh, we vote electronically. We're in the modern world, no more paper. So there'll be a, instructions, very simple, online as well that you can pull up your phone or your computer, you can go online and you can go ahead and vote. So we trust that God is leading us together. That's what this is about. Uh, we want to be transparent, honest with what we're doing and who we are. You are the congregation. These are the people of God. And the vote is a chance to affirm that. Now, set the table for next week. I had the easy job. I got to lead us into green pastures and still waters. Adam is going to come back and take us into the valley of the shadow of death next week, which is in Psalm 23. But here's the thing. Think about this. This is, this is uh, food for thought for this week. I believe that you have to have pasture time to be able to walk through valley time. Without pasture time, the valleys become overwhelming. So let's move into the pastures this week, and then next week Adam will do a great job, I'm sure, teaching us about how God is with us, even in the valley of the shadow of death. Um, take advantage of this and other resources. God bless you. Oh, wait, on the screen, can we put it up there? If you, can, if you know how to scan that right now with your phone, this will take you to the link that gives you all the resources. But you're getting this book on the way out if you're here. If you're not here, come next week. We might have some left over. Otherwise, download the PDF. Have a great week. God, God bless you. Love you.